effort and energy put in these classes is not more not necessary. Yeah, but they go on for too long. You know, the 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 the, the end of it is a uh, class on a capital pillum that's seven sukim goes on for eight weeks. It should happen. It should happen faster. Yeah, it is a problem. It really is. Because you have to move at a reasonable pace. Like a person who starts learning commission after five years, where you're holding, but yeah, middle the kim you hear. So okay. Uh, at some point, do you continue? I would think. Yeah, but it's okay to also delve into it. Uh, the operative word is balance. Yeah, but like, you know, if you get stuck in it, so you, you're missing a lot of things. Like, like, it's nice and everything. Hey, the deal. I think that I, I could, if I wanted to go through it fast, I can open up a commercial with you. Mm. If I want it, I'd rather the classes be private. I understand, but I'm going a bit too slow. Okay. Put him here. Okay, we're good. Oh, um, I just want to make sure. Video, yes. Um, does everybody have one of these pages? Because today you may actually need it. Um, you should. Got one of these? You get one of these. I got five. So if more than five girls need, someone's going to have to go downstairs and I have four actually. Please come again. If nobody needs, uh, you can send it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. This is our third week of Masech Ben Guinness. And the last two weeks, I didn't even give you a break, right? I just talked from the time I got it until 12 20. I'm okay with that. Um, The first week, I translated the Pedic for you, and I gave you my own personal proposal, if you could remember, it was the week before Purim. My own personal proposal is that this is the tefillah that Goyim are going to say after Mashiach comes. That was my argument, and my, my basis for it was that this entire capital, it never once says Shem Havaya, it never says Yud Kei only Shem Elikim. And it doesn't even say a lekenu, except for once. And I told you in my own personal fantasy that after Mashiach comes, Goyim are going to have their own siddur. And in their siddur, on a very special occasion, they're not going to say a lekim, they're going to say a lekenu, our God. And in this Patek, the word a lekim appears how many times? One, two, three, Four, five. The word alekim five times, and one time the word alekenu. So in the class of two times ago, that's how I presented it to you. Last week I gave you five different insights from five different svarim. Basically, this capital has to do with the, with the menoira. This capital has to do with birchas koyhanim. This capital has to do with Moshe Rabbein was negotiating with Hakadosh Baruch Hu about the Yanam of Nevuah, about the special intimacy between Yidin and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And a couple more insights, which I'm not remembering off the top of my head. And one of them was this idea that in this capital, there's an emphasis on Pnei on the face of God. So Rabbi said, here's what's going to happen. Okay, my introductions are over. 
in the first two weeks that we learned this, we sort of set the stage. We're actually ready to learn the capital inside, but uh, I suspect that today it's not gonna happen. In other words, now that we're finished with introductions, we're ready to start the capital, and I'm gonna give you another introduction. And I'll tell you how I mean this. I'll tell you how I mean this. As I always tell you, I'm not an expert on Siddur, I'm not. I'm one week ahead of you. In other words, when I'm teaching you something, I get up early in the morning and I take out my books, I make my copies, and I do my research. These are my notes. <laughs> These are my notes on this little paragraph. And I write notes. And what I do over time is I read various different mythology. I read a bunch of different opinions. Bishoinim, Achreinim, Mekubolim, and then, of course, Chasidus. And after I finish with all of that, I try to come up with one pirush. This is what I try to do. In other words, based on all the information that I've collected from the different svarim, I try to come to you and I say, listen, I'm not giving you 50 different opinions. We're going to be learning this pedic. And we're going to be learning this pedic with one approach, one gisha, one approach. And that this one approach is, I guess the right word is distilled, is boil down, is cooked down from all the different things that I read and all the different things that I uh, discovered and sort of developed over the research period that I did. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. This capital, we're going to be learning based on my own conclusions. That's the bad part. I'm telling you my understanding, my own conclusions of this capital based on the research that I did, which of course is written in many svarim, including, and I guess I should say honestly, especially chassidus. There's, there's enough chassidus in this capital. There's not chassidus in every word, but there's enough chassidus in this capital to help you flush out the capital. So from here forward, I'm not giving you different interpretations. I'm gonna be giving you one interpretation of the Pedic, one interpretation of the capital, based on the research that I did. Now, remember one thing. I tell this to you in every class, Kimat, right? The most important thing you have to know about davening in terms of learning the davening is that davening is like real estate. Location, location, location. Where something is has everything to do with what it's about. Now, it's Ekman Guinness is said during the weekdays, that on Shabbos and Yom Tov, we don't do like the Beisir Yisip, as I explained to you last week. During the weekdays, before Baruch Sha'am, before Baruch Shama, but after Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach, Hashem Yimlech, right? The previous shtikila that we learned earlier this year was Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach, Hashem Yimlech, Hashem God, Ba'ya Adeshem Lamech, Al-Kala Aras, Ba'ya Yimlech, Ba'ya Adeshem Lamech, Al-Kala Aras, Ba'ya Yimlech, Ba'ya Yimlech, right? We learned it this year. This year, right? This is our third, didn't we learn Midrash Shechem, was last year. We learned Hashem Elach this year, correct? So it's a bunch of weeks on Hashem Elach. It's on the same page, right? The sheet, if you have this sheet in front of you, you have a Shemelech, a Shienu, and Lama Tzayach Beginis. It's the last three pieces before Baruch Shama. Now, what do we know about location? We know about location that this is the world of Asiya, that this is the world of Asiya. Now, does anybody believe in Ashkoch Pratis? Yeah. Especially today. Did you learn today's Tanya? Today's Tanya. It's a long one and it's a hard one. I'm not going to hold it against you. But if you learn today's Tanya, today's Tanya is exactly about how I explained to you Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach, when we learned it. And it's going to matter now also. Okay? If you could remember earlier this winter, when we learned Hashem Elach, when we learned Hashem Melech, I explained to you something, the following. I don't know, you weren't here. I mean, we're learning a whole winter. You weren't. You came in the middle of these classes or the Chumash classes, the Yisrael classes. I explained to you as follows. Your students in a Chassidish Yeshiva, in a Chabad Chassidish Yeshiva, which means that you dabble in Kabbalah, right? You come across Kabbalah language in your learning because it's one of the things we learn. We learn Chassidus, and in learning Chassidus, we touch on concepts in Kabbalah. And one of the concepts that we discuss in Kabbalah is the concept of the ten sphidus. Remember that? The ten sphidus. So here is the point that I've been making. Ten sphidus are not a world. 
Just like a brain and a heart is not a person. The ten spheres, Chach, Mavina, Daz, Chesed, Yivurah, Tiferes, Netzach, Ali, Said, Malchus, are all in your brain, or at best, in your brain and in your heart. Because I need your attention. I feel like you're not listening to me. Put away your phone. Put away your phone. Put away your phone. You don't have to sit here, but don't sit here and do other business. I'm sorry. I do that for a living. I teach boys. I teach girls. I'm used to it. I come here and have attentive students. <laughs> That's why I stick around my one day a week in Machan Chana. Machan If you're not going to listen to me, don't sit in this room, please. It's disrespectful. I'm sorry. I'm not having it. A world is not ten spheres, just like a person is not a brain. A world is a body with arms and legs and skin and hair and nails, as is described in the Tanya, at the center of a person is a brain. And in today's Tanya, today's Tanya, Chov, Zion, other Shady, in the Ibrayar cycle, which is a long piece. Every Wednesday this year is a very long Tanya because in the year that the Rebbe made the Moirashi, it was Shabbos. Every Wednesday we have a very long Tanya. Today's Tanya talks about the Shamas leaving this world and going up to heaven. When the Shamas leave this world and they go up to heaven, they don't go into Gan Eden. They don't. There's no room for them in Gan Eden. They go into the world. The world of Bria, the world of Yitzira, the world of Asiya, based on the world from which they came. But in the center of that world, there's a Mesa Mikdash. Each world has a center. The center of the world is the Mesa Mikdash. The Mesa Mikdash, that's Gan Eden. And in the base of Mikdash, their Torah and Mitzvahs are deposited. Yeah, you're living. You're Baruch Hashem. You're alive and well. We're all alive and well. We learn Torah and do Mitzvahs. Hopefully we do it with Kavona. The Torah and the Mitzvahs we do go up to our world and they're deposited in the base of Mikdash. The center. We don't live in the base of Mikdash. We live in the world. If you want to understand a world like a person, our Torah and Mitzvahs go into the brain of Elam Abri. The brain of Elam Ayatzira, the brain of Elam Asiya. We, the people and the animals, which means the Nishamas and the Malachim of each world, are not ours. But it has windows. And the Torah mitzvah we did, which we deposited into the base, I make the shine through the windows, and it comes to us. And we have Bogodim, we have Malbushim, we have garments, the Torah mitzvah that we did our garments. And it brings to us the light of the Torah and mitzvahs that we did. So there's a world, and then in the center of that world, there's the holiness of that world. Just like there's a person, and the center of a person is his brain, or her brain, the neshama rests in the brain, and from the brain it radiates to the whole person. Every world is the same way. Okay, now, if from Hareini Makabah, Right from the beginning of the city, from the time you come to Shul and you ask Hashem permission to enter, and you thank Hashem for giving you permission, as I told you this many times, in many customs, there's a tradition to say as you walked into the Shul, we enter into the house of God, we walk to the house of God with emotion. We say every morning in Matebu, thank you for letting me into your space. We come into a shul and we daven. So from Areni Makabela Lai Mitzvah Sasei Shadrech which is on page, whatever this is, until this page is Asiya. Asiya is a dynamic place. She is a world. The center of that world, the godliness of that world, is called the Beis Amikdash, the temple of that world. The center of that world, the godliness of that world, it's called the Ganein, the Garden of Eden. The center of that world, the godness of that world, is called the Holy of Holies. In Asiya, it's Hashem Melech. It's this. We say these words, which we learned three months ago or two months ago. These are the Hashem Melech, Hashem Melech, Hashem Melech, and God. This goes on the, the godliness of Asiya. This is a concept which is brought in Kabbalah, and I explained it to you with all kinds of the Muslims that do with the Nekudes. The original source, of it, I mean, we read it from the Sefer, which is called from a Siddur, or a Shmuel Vital, whose name I don't remember at the moment. The bottom line is, we understand that if we get to the end of Asiya, you're going into the base of Mikdash. Meaning, if Daviding is a ladder, it's a ladder with many rungs. 
Basically, there are four rungs. Asiyah, Yitzira, Bri, Atzilas. Until Barak Sha'amar is Asiyah. Beginning with Barak Sha'amar is Yitzira. At the end of Asiyah, you're in the highest level within Asiyah itself. So when we read Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach a couple of months ago, this here, this piece, we're now doing this piece. In this piece, I explained to you based on Sfarim, what's the name of the city of Shmuel Vital? What's it called? Chemdas Yisrael, maybe. Chemdas Yisrael. That this is going on the 10 spheres of Asir. Meaning, you're in the lowest world, but in the lowest world itself, you're climbing. The climax, the highest point of the lowest world is when you come into the 10 spheres. Now, what could this possibly be? If this is the 10 spheres of Asir, what's this? So I'm going to tell you my opinion. On the one hand, it's my opinion. On the other hand, it's not my opinion at all because it's based on what I read in different svarim. I couldn't make this up. I'm not smart enough. This is Shema Vaya and this is Shema Lekim. This is Yud Kevavki. This is Shema Lekim. In other words, if from Matoivu, from page whatever it is, 15 in the Siddha, until this, which is, I don't know what page number it is, all these pages, Matoivu and Adain Elam, and Vehiyachar, and Laylam Yehiyadam, and Kavashasar, the ash and the tomid and the ktaires and abayin is oh my we've been learning this for years we've been learning Siddur probably for 10 12 years here and we're holding Barash Omar finally if at the very end of Asiya Hashem Melech is the sweetest is the godliness of Asiya what's this this is Avaya this is a Lakim Hashem Melech Hashem Melech Hashem Avaya this is a Lakim five times a Lakim a Lakim does not mention Avaya once so you should ask a question. You're entitled to ask a question. Isn't Shem Havaya Yud Kei higher than Shem Malachim? So if I was writing the Siddur, and I'm not, right? I'm just studying. I'm trying to study it. I would argue that first you should have a Lakim, then you should have a Vaya. The order doesn't make sense. If at the very end of Asiyah, and that's what we're holding, right? Baruch Shama is the beginning of Yitzir. If the very, very end of Asiyah, you're entering into the SS fetus. How does this capital tell him? Psalm 68, 67. Lam Ginois, where you only mention Shem Elikim, follow Adeshemelech, 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 which is Shem Avaya, which is SS fetus of Asir. Because I'm going to tell you the answer and then I'll let you talk. The answer is that it says in Kabbalah and it's brought in Hasidus. And I read it this morning when I was studying this paragraph. It's Paydek. That normally we say that Elikim is lower than Avaya. But there's an Elikim which is higher than Avaya. And Maseyach ben Gine is, is talking about Hashem's name, Elikim. As opposed to Hashem's name, Yudke Vavke. But the Elikim here is on a higher level than the Havaya. For example, Yitzchak Avinu, Gebyankav Avinu, Abracha, right? How do they start? Yitzchak Avinu, Isaac, our father, gave Jacob a father a blessing. How does he start? V'yiten l'cha l'kim. Mital ha-shemayim, mishmani ha-ar, z'reib dog and v'sidish. Yiten l'cha l'kim. And the question is asked in the Maimorim. If Yitzchak is giving his son a bracha, why does he give a bracha from Shema l'kim? Shouldn't he give a bracha from Shema v'ayah? Good question, right? I need someone to nod. Yeah? Right? And then the answer, of course, is what do you mean? Yitzchak's me does gvura. Yitzchak is Gevura, right? Avraham is Chesed, Yitzchak is Gevura. So Yitzchak is a bracha using Shem Elikim. Yeah, but Shem Elikim is a name of Gevura. And why would Yitzchak, even if his, his Midas Gevura, use a, a, a Shem of Gevura to give a bracha? Isn't Gevura cheap? Isn't Gevura contained? Isn't Gevura strict? Isn't Gevura exact? Isn't Gevura judging? Why would he give a bracha Shem Elikim? And it answers in the Maimodim that the Shema Lekim of Gevura, in that case, Yitzchak Lekim, is higher than Shema Vaya. And I'm going to explain that to you now. We're going to be talking about this now. In other words, I am starting my expose, my, my understanding of this capital, with the study of why here we use Shem Elikim, Aleph Lamed Hei Yud Mem. And that actually, Elikim here is higher than Havaya. In other words, you're going into the base of Iktash, of Asiyah, the Holy of Holy of Asiyah. First you made Shema Avaya, then you made Shema Lekim, because Lekim is even higher than Avaya. That's what I'm intent on explaining. That's how we're starting our discussion, our discourse on Lam Naseich Beginis, which is what I'm teaching you. That here, the Lekim comes after Havaya, because the Lekim is higher than Shema Avaya. How? How is Shema Lekim higher than Shema Avaya? So first of all, 
it just in this case? In some cases, there's other cases. There's more than one. Yitel Lachol Kim is a second case. There are instances where Shema Lachim is explained to be higher than Shema Abaya. How? First of all, Gvura is a bad. Gvura is a bad. Gvura is just exact. Yeah, Gvura walks in the street and he sees a beggar. Do you know what he does? He judges. If the beggar is a beggar because he's a loser and lazy and an addict, he says, you do it to yourself, I'm not helping you. But if Vodor walks in the street and sees somebody who's down on his luck and judges and determines that this person is really, it's not his fault or her laziness, so he gives. And when Gvura gives, he gives with strength. He gives more than chesed. Gvura is exact. He's not mean. He's exact. He's precise. So if you don't deserve, you're not going to get. But when you do the, Gvura doesn't hand out dollar bills. You understand? Chesed is dollar bills to everybody. Gvura hands out hundreds to the worthy. It's called Takapoidis. Yitzchak Smith is Gevura. He gives Yankar Ravinu Abrach of Yitzchak Lekim. Because Elikim, when Elikim gives, he gives more than Avaya. And the Elikim of this capital, Psalm 67, Elikim Yechaneni Vivarchenu, Yor Pono Vitonu Salodaz, Vartikam Tiduham Elikim, Yiduham Kulum. Elikim, Elikim, Elikim. The Elikim over here, Aleph Lamed Hey Yud Mem, is a Gevura which is higher than Chesed. It's godliness, which is even higher than Shem Avayi. Now you had your hand raised. So I was going to say that we learn a lot of times um, that the Elikim is higher than Shem Right. There's some, there's some uh, relevance to that idea here, but it's, it's a little bit complicated. Now, I can't find my phone. What does that make me? Is it a bubble or what? I got two phones, I need a third, right? <laughs> what I need is peace of mind. And I still like I'm a phone that peace of mind. So I'm always meant. Do you want me to call it? Um, let me see if I can find it in my pocket, which is probably where it is, which is why I should not be doing this. If I look for it now, I look for it now later, it makes a difference. But I'm nervous. I'm nervous because I've got self control. Ta -da. Okay, now I can teach. Does anybody else want to say anything? I mean it. This is the time for me to let you talk or for me to break. I threw an idea at you. I threw an idea at you. And for some of you, it's new. That there's a shame of the which is higher than shame of I. Also, I think that like being, give, uh, giving people rules and stuff, being strict can give them a lot more freedom. So. To understand like how it could be a kindness to be able to see the, the strict side. No. No. You're right, but no. <laughs> I asked you many times. Would you like to be judged? <laughs> By no one. By no one. Favorably. Judgment, then you're not judged. Then you're overlooked. Judgment hurts. The truth hurts. Period. Yeah, but sometimes you need to know it. Because Maybe you need, but you don't want. It's like, it's like you, you have a mirror at home <laughs> that like makes you like look thin and whatever and like you see it in the mirror and like if you go to the real mirror, you you will see that not the same thing. I didn't ask you what's true or false. I asked you what you want. I like, Nobody. I really? Yeah. And you, but somebody else should point it out to you. Yeah. No. Yeah. You want to go into a closet where nobody is around and look in the mirror by yourself. Nobody wants Anybody, to be judged. I, I don't know. I, I, okay, guys, I want to I'm not having a conversation. I'm a teacher. And we're learning. This is not becoming a fabring. I have to say this now. It's not, everyone doesn't have a chance to say what they think and feel. You respond to what I say. Okay. I want to make, this is getting carried away. I'm going to, I need you to understand this. Rosh Hashanah, we're judged. You know what they do in a court of law? Yeah. They have a prosecuting attorney and a defense attorney. Right. What's the difference between the two? The prosecutor's job is to take your individual actions that are not good and point them out. The defense attorney's job is not to say he's a liar because he's not lying. 
defense attorney is saying, don't look at one action, look at the whole person. That's the difference between Gvura and Chesed. Nobody wants to be judged. Judgment, the biggest tzaddik, it doesn't pass the biggest tzaddik is judged, there's fault in every person. It's a fact. Kuvuda judges. Now, it says in Chesidus, when Mashiach comes, we're going to be holy by the Madre Gavura. We'll, we'll be in such a high level that our bad will, will, will be able to handle it, right? In the story of Kairach and Moshe, Kairach was Levi, Levi is Gavura. Aaron is Chesed. Kairach is screaming, I'm better than Aaron. And Moshe says, You are, but not now after Mashiach comes. Judgment is true, but it hurts. It hurts. So, the, the idea of Shema Lekim showing you your faults to make you improve yourself is a little complicated. Point well taken. Point well taken. Okay, but we're not talking about that here. The Lekim over here is not about judgment. The Lekim over here is about a level of godliness which is so high that it cannot be revealed. It's a Lekim which is higher than Shema Vayim. This is what we're discussing. So it's not about judgment. Because if it's about judgment, it ain't good. We don't want to be judged. Now, I did, I said, yes, that there's a concept of Yitzchak. Yitzchak is giving Yanka the bracha, that when you deserve, you get a lot. But in this case, it's deeper than that. It's not only that Yitzchak is judging Yanka, and he says that Yanka is a tzaddik, so he's giving him a lot of brachas. The name of the Kim here means a level of godliness which is above revelation, which I'm going to explain in a moment. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Go ahead. Um. I think last week you described Gibbura as like you gave an example of like someone who parks a car even though there's a no parking and then comes out. Was that you? No. Nope. Was a different teacher? What's that? What's that? But you, you heard that also, right? Yeah. Someone compared Gibbura as the person who will park oh, even though they don't that. see. Even though they see that they're not allowed to, and then when they come out, they ask for mercy, which is chesed. Right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So can Does you anybody have any relevant comments? <laughs> no, no, no. So basically my question is, can you retranslate Gibor and chesed? <laughs> My topic isn't Kavura. My topic is Alukim. No, I know, but like. They're not in this. Or... It's... I'm going to do this. But girls, I'm the teacher. We're learning Lamaseyak in Guinness. This is not a psychology class. I'm going to answer. It matters to all of you. I'm going to answer. But that's it. We're leaving us alone. We're learning about Elikib in this Pedic. I know that I come across very intense. So you feel like I'm criticizing you. I'm just, I need to control this class. I want to teach what I want to teach. I don't want to just wander off. Even though it's a lot more fun and a lot easier. And I have less work to do because if I waste time this week, the next week I don't have to prepare. But I want to teach you this, but I'm going to answer you, okay? I, brought up you brought up I know, and I regret bringing it up. <laughs> um, I brought it up, and then she said it, she said it, she said, I'm angry at me, not at any of you. I shouldn't have said it. You walk in the street, see a beggar sitting on a grate. He's sitting on a grate because underneath the ground there's a train, and it's and producing heat. Now, that heat is an exhaust. It's very unhealthy to breathe that air. But he's cold and it's the winter. So he's sitting on the grate and he's got his cup out and he's asking people for, for money. And you walk by, what is your instinctive response? Don't answer, let me do the talking. Your instincting, instinctive response is to feel bad. Unless you're pathological, unless you're sick. The basic human response is to feel bad. Why? He's human and you're human. You relate to him. If it was a, uh, an animal, a mammal, that was desperate and was crying out, you would also feel bad because uh, 
I hate to use these words, you're closely enough related to him that his physical, his physiological communications of his emotional and physical state resonate with you. You, relate, you. you understand when an animal says, I'm in pain, even though it doesn't use words. You understand when an animal says, I'm hungry. But if it was a mollusk, if it was a uh, um, crab, and the crab is crying in pain, you would know the crab is crying in pain because it doesn't speak a language which in any way, shape, or form resonates with you. So you feel another creature, another human being, because of their proximity to you, you feel their pain, you relate to their pain, and you want it to go away. Now, psychologically, what you really are afraid of is when you see another human being's pain, it makes you appreciate your own vulnerability. That could be me in an instant. So there's a selfishness to it. You meet a stranger, never seen him before. That stranger is at a disadvantage, right? They're pathetic. It's an achmonis on them. That's the language we would use. Your instinctive response is to do whatever you can to make that pain go away. That's called chesed. The Zohar says famously, and it's brought in many places in Hasidus, every emotion begins with love. Chesed, ozel, and kula yevin. Every emotion begins with love. Why? Because love means connection. Love means relatedness. The most superficial emotion is love. The most superficial emotion is I see another human being or animal even going through a certain experience, and I relate to it. That's chesed. And I want to fix it. And you could even say that when I'm going to give that other person a dollar, I'm really giving it to myself. I want that pain to go away because that pain makes me feel vulnerable. Okay? So you walk by a grave, you see a, a pathetic person, a needy person, a broken person, a hungry person, a human being who was once in kindergarten and loved by his mommy and his tati, and now he's an adult or she's an adult and they're, they're a failure. They're not, they haven't made it. They can't take care of themselves. They need other people to give them gifts. They're living on the street. When your first response is to feel bad and to do an act of kindness, that's chesed. Okay? You, you're walking in the street. You walk by a person sitting on a grate and they're begging for alms. And your first instinct is to help them. And they say, wait a minute, I know you. I went to school with you. You were classmates. Look at me and look at you. I don't understand. We were in the same volleyball team. We, we both went to camp together. How come you're like this and I'm like this? You, you wasted your time. I remember what you did in high school. You got involved with drugs. You stopped coming to school. So you are where you are and I am where I am because of the choices I made and the choices you made. This is Gvuda. And you emotionally say, not necessarily with words, I got what's coming to me, you got what's coming to you. You're judging. You're not judging with your, judging with your heart. Your heart looks at that person and says, whew, thank God I was good in high school. <laughs> thank God I didn't do the wrong thing. The judgment includes not just that person's failure, but your own success. So when you look at that person, you say, you know, I know you, and you're in this position because of the poor choices you made. And forgive me for saying these words. What you got, you made a bed, sleep in it. What you got, you earned. This is your life because of the mistakes, because of the stupid choices that you made. And you don't help them. You don't help them because emotionally, it's righteous that you should have what you have and they should have what they have. That's called Guru. Are you mean? Are you bad? Are you cruel? No. You're just honest. With me so far? I need you to nod. Yeah. You walk by a grate. There's a person sitting on a grate. Your first instinct is to help that person. Your second instinct is this person is where they are because of the stupid choices they make. They deserve to be there. And your third instinct is this if I was that person, I would be as guilty as sin, but I would want someone to help me. That's called the rachamim. That's called the fairness. Meaning, chesed says, I give that person because I want pain to go away. Gvura says, no, no, the world is fair. 
And the Rachamim says it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. A person needs help, I have to help them. Those are the three primary emotions. Chesed, so mystically, Chesed is the most superficial. To use fancy words, Chesed is Chesed, Gevur is Emes, and Tiferes is Emes Lamite. Chesed is kind, Gevur is honest, and Tiferes is absolutely honest. Absolute honesty means this moment, this person needs my help, and I'm going to help him, even if they did it to themselves, because that's the right thing to do. Okay, so I gave you an expose in Chesed, Gevur, and Tiferes. Okay, so and it's for the three of you. This is a baton to all three of you. Yeah, yeah, I'll answer. And now you gotta behave. Now you don't. Please don't. Don't tell me your thoughts. Stick to the. What I, I'm teaching you. Respond to what I'm saying. Not all. I shouldn't have mentioned gvura. I caused myself a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We're talking about Hashem's name, Elokim, which means concealment. But we're dealing with Hashem's name, Elokim, which is higher than Shem Avaya. And I'll tell you how. It's very simple. One of the big problems that Torah has, and one of the big problems that Jewish theology has, and one of the big problems that Hasidus has, is what should you call God? What is, what is the right word to describe Hashem? What word would best describe him? There are no words. Because a word has to describe. It's above form. A word has a meaning. And a meaning expresses what something is, but by expressing what it is, you're also expressing what it is not. When it comes to God, God is not anything that is limited in any way, shape, or form. There really are no words to denote him. But there are so many words that mean God, right? Beginning with the Tanakh. In Tanakh, Hashem has seven names. Kel, Kim, Havaya, Svois, Shakai, Adnai, Ekyeh. Correct? Hashem has many names. In Aloha, he has seven names. In Kabbalah, he has ten names. So how can Hashem have names if he's not entitled to names? Because he's Hashem. The answer, it says in the Medrash, is that, that the names of Hashem are not describing what that he is, they're describing what he does. My name is Yosef Yitzchak. My name is not describing one action. It's describing my soul, my infinity. I can do a thousand actions. It's called the shame etzim. My name is not describing what I do. My name is describing who I am. Hashem's names don't describe what he is because there is no name for that. Hashem's name describes what he's doing. He's relating to the world. It's very complicated. It's very, very involved. There's a lot of Hasidus on it. It's a Machzedek has an essay called Shadish Mitzvah Tfila. I have it online if you want to listen to it where he spends prokem upon prokem upon prokem dealing with this question of the names of God. How do you understand the names of Hashem? The names of Hashem are not describing what he is by himself. The names of Hashem are describing him in his relationship with the world. Now, so you get through that. One minute. You get through that. that the names of Hashem are not describing what he is. The names of Hashem are describing what he does, yeah? Now, but is there a name for what he is? <laughs> After that. The names of Hashem describe what it is. Is there a name that describes what he is by himself? So this, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated Aminut. It's a very, very complicated world. It's a very, very complicated world. So now I'll give you an example. I'm going to let you speak first. I'll give you my word. You have come across in your learning the term Atmos, right? Sometimes we call Hashem Atmos, Atmos Amos. What does that mean, Atmos? How is that a word that denotes HaKadosh Baruch? How does it mean Hashem? So I've told this to you many times. The translation of the word Etzem, Atzmi, Atzmoi, Atzmus is anything in its relationship with itself. When you call Hashem Atmos, what you're saying is this word means not Hashem's relationship with the world, but Hashem as he is by himself. In other words, Atmos is the opposite of the Midrashic definition of the names of Hashem. If the names of Hashem are describing what he's doing, Hasidus and Kabbalah have found a term that means him not what he's doing as he is by himself. The translation of the word Atmos means Hashem is, is alone. So what do we know about that? We only know one thing, 
that as Hashem is alone, it's different, it's more than as Hashem is in relationship with the world. That makes sense. So we will use the term Atmos or Atmos and Hos. And again, I'm going to give you my technical translations. Atmos means Hashem as he is by himself. And Mohus means the substance of that, the richness of what Hashem is, is by himself. So we use the word Atmos precisely to say that there are things about Hashem that we cannot know. And there are things about Hashem that we can know. What can we know about Hashem? What he gave us in the world. What can we not know about Hashem? What he didn't give us in the world. So the ideas of Hashem that are not involved in the creation, we call Atmos. Okay? You follow? So we're looking for language. We're always looking for words that are going to properly or adequately or somewhat denote mean God in a way that actually makes sense, where A, it makes sense, B, it's true. So the names of Hashem, the way it's written in Medrash, are not describing his by himself. The names of Hashem are describing him in his relationship with the world. Right? When Hasidus wants to use a word that means Hashem, it's not really the word to use the word Atmos Amos. And the Rebbe spoke a hundred times about the fact that even Atmos Amos is not a proper name for Hashem because we don't begin to know what it means, God. So it's a very, very long story. Okay? Now, I want to tell you one more name of Hashem that's used in Hasidus and Kabbalah, and then you're going to speak first because you're kind enough to actually raise your hand. Okay? And that is this. In some places in Hasidus, when they want to talk about God, they use the expression Helem Ha'atzmi. Helem, if you want to write it down, is Hey Ayin Lamed Mem. Ha'atzmi is Hey Ayin Sadik Mem Yud Mem. Or Helem Be'etzem. There's a number of different forms. Helem Ha'atzmi. Helem Ha'atzmi. Or Helem Be'etzem. Now, what do these words mean? There's actually a mime from the Rebbe, where the Rebbe quotes the term Helam Atzmi and he writes in the footnote, this is the expression used in many my modern. You're trying to describe Hashem, which you cannot do. The names of Hashem found in Tanakh are describing the relationship with the world. If you want to use the word that denotes Hashem with no relationship with the world, we, we in the Chabad culture use the word Atzmas, although it's very complicated. Another term which is found in the my modern is Helam Atzmi. Hidden in relation to the translation of the words, Helam Ha'atzmi means hidden in relationship with self. And I want to explain this to you. I want to explain this to you. Okay, and again, I'm going to let you speak first. I give you my word, okay? What is the meaning of revelation? Can you close that door, please? Thank you. What is the meaning of revelation? Gilui. Gilui. Uh, Giloi means something goes from a giver to a receiver and the receiver gets it. Revelation is not defined by the revealer. It's defined by the revealee. I'm teaching you. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm wasting my time on your time. I'm not revealing. Revealing is determined by the recipient. Giloi has a last name. Revelation has a last name. Giloi's last name is El Hazulas. You reveal to somebody else. And the trademark of Gili is I'm revealing to somebody else and the somebody else gets it. Do you understand that? Yeah. Simple concept. Simple concept. What's the opposite of Gili? We're revealed. Hidden. Hello. Right? What does hidden mean? You don't see it. Yeah. Why don't you see it? A, you don't have eyes. You don't have the eyes. You're not sensitive. B, there's a blockage. Right? So Gili means I'm revealing something to you and you're getting it. Hela means I'm trying to reveal something to you, but it's not getting to you. Either it's not getting to you because you don't have the eyes, or it's not getting to you because I'm, I'm blocking it. Right? But the opposite of Gili is Hela. So Hasidus makes a philosophical argument that says Hela is the beginning of Gili. Before something is revealed, it's hidden. Before I teach it to you, I think about it first. Okay, and if you want to use fancy schmancy words, Gilu is Mamala Kalaman and Helen is Seva Kalaman. Before something is revealed, it's hidden. Meaning, I want to teach you. Before I teach, I prepare. When I'm preparing, I don't yet have the language which I'm going to talk to you. At that stage, the idea is that I'm going to teach you later in a state of hidden, but hidden is the beginning of revealed. 
Hidden is the beginning of revealed. Meaning to say, it has to do with you, but it's not getting to you. If it has to do with you and it gets to you, that's Gilu. If it has to do with you and doesn't get to you, it's called hello. You follow so far? So far, so good, or this is too much? Huh? Are we good? Yeah. Now, then there's a third idea. It has absolutely nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. If it has nothing to do with you, you can't call it Helen. Because Helen means it's hidden from you. It's called Helen Bietzen. Helen Ha'atzmi. Helen Bietzen means I'm hidden not because I'm hiding. I'm hidden not because you cannot see me. I'm hidden not because I'm blocking. I'm hidden because I exist only for me. So we have three words, girls, three words. Gilui, Helen, and Helen Ha'atzmi. Helen means I'm hidden from you. Helen Ha'atzmi means I'm hidden because it's just about me. I'm not hiding. It's just you don't see me. Not you don't see me because I'm hiding. You don't see me because I'm existing in relationship with myself. Did you understand the translation of those three words? Huh? You understood the translation of three words? Okay, now you speak. I think your name is Rivka, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the question is, uh, like this word, uh, if we are limited in the God, same with the word God, and like all these words, a almighty, and all, all words, like if call it this way, God, God, am I eliminating him? And if yeah, why can I do this? The, the why can I do it because I don't I have no I have no brain I have no choice I have to identify I mean I don't have a word which correctly identifies him so I borrow a word which identifies him a little bit but it's okay like you have no again how long the Torah does it the Chumash does it God himself does it but I don't know don't believe the God like you're not limiting the God no you're saying because of course, I don't have the right word to use. I'm going to use the wrong word, but I'm going to know it's the wrong. Word. I'm going to say I'm using, even though it's not the right word, because I have to use some word. Oh, you understand? Yes, yeah. Right. So now the names of Hashem in Tanakh are proper names, right? If you have a sefetera and the sefetera becomes possible, you scratch off the word and you fix it, right? But Aishis, if there's a problem with the base of Aishis, you scratch it, you rewrite it, yeah? What if there's a problem with the word Alekim? Allah of Lama tell you, I mean, Allah will erase it. You have to cut out the piece of parchment, paste another piece in the back, and rewrite it because you're not allowed to erase Hashem's name. So Hashem has seven names, holy names in Tanakh, but you're not allowed to erase, which means they're describing him, even though we know they're not describing him, they're describing his relationship with us. So Torah gives Hashem names and says these names are holy, even though they're not describing him, they're describing his relationship to us. In later Svar, like in Chassidus, we create new names. We call them Atmos. You're allowed to erase the word Atmos. Atmos doesn't tell us what he is. Atmos simply means how he is by himself. You understand? Yeah. So now I'm giving you another term to put into your, into your box of names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Tell them Atmos, Hashem is hidden. Not because he's hiding. Hashem is hidden because he's by himself. Helem, there's Helem, there's Giloi, Helem, and Helem Atmos. There's three levels. Gilo means revealed. It means it's reaching us. Helem means it's hidden. It means it's supposed to reach us and hasn't gotten to us. And Helem Atmos means Hashem is hidden, not because he's hiding, but because we don't see him. So now, Kindalach, I want you to think about this, okay? When we juxtapose the name Hashem and the name Elikim, normally Hashem means Hashem is giving. And Elikim means Hashem is judging. But it's brought in Hasidus, and I'm assuming it is in Kabbalah, although I can be sure, that there's another level, which is the other way around. Hashem means the God that you could see, and Elikim means the God that you cannot see. And when you flip it around, Elikim becomes higher than Shemalai. Havaya means godliness revealed. How much? 
the maximum that you can get. Elakim means the godness that you cannot know. It's not revealed, but it's not hidden either. It's he as he is by himself. It's called Helema Atzmi, Hashem. And he's not hiding from us. How he exists only in relationship with self, we don't know him. Not we don't know him because he's hidden and concealed. We don't know him because we don't have any ability to relate to Atmos, to Hashem as he is by himself. This is this concept of a name of a kim, which is higher than a name of Vaya. It's all upside down. If I mean him, it's revealed. How much ain't safe, but revealed to us. And then there's a Lakim which is not revealed. Not only is it not revealed, it's not even hidden. It's how he is by himself. There's two, three things. Gilui, Helen, and Helen Ba'etzem. There's revealed. There's he wants to be revealed, but we're not getting him. And then there's he is how he is by himself. He is as he is by himself. It's not revealed. It's not, it's not revealed. It's not hidden. It's just who he is. Now, I, 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 I guess this is a hard concept to understand a little bit, yeah? So let me give you examples. I'll give you examples. Simple proste examples. I use the word proste as it's understood in Russian, not in Yiddish. Benign examples, neutral, simple examples. Just think about these examples. I want you to think about these examples. Adin Evan Yisrael, who's now deceased, unfortunately. Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael, one of the great masters of Torah, we're geniuses of our generation. And a very big activist, a very, he's a soldier of the Rebbe, no doubt about it. Wrote a little article on the Rebbe, a short little blurb in an in a, in a album that came out in the 1970s called Harebe. I, I had it as a child before my mitzvah. And in this little blurb, blurb Adin Evan Yisrael writes as follows. People say that the Rebbe is a hidden tzaddik. People say that the Rebbe hides himself. As much as the Rebbe leads, as much as the Rebbe gives, the Rebbe is hiding. There's things about the Rebbe that nobody knows because the Rebbe is hiding. That's what he says. People say the Rebbe is hiding. Says Rabbi Steinzel, says Rabbi Eben Yisrael, and I say he's not hiding at all. It's only that the Rebbe is one of those people that whatever he does, he does only for himself. He's not trying to show. He does whatever he does, he does only for himself. When he davens, it's him and God. He's not thinking about being observed. When he studies Torah, it's him and God. Everything he does, he does only for himself. And then Rabbi Steinzel says in his genius, when people do things only for themselves, others don't notice. You don't see. Nevijou, you don't see it. Not because it's blocked, not because it's hidden. Because you just don't know this. That's his argument. Rabbi Stein's also, we have evidence all says that the Rebbe could do something right in front of you and you won't even see that he did it. You know why? He's not, he's not hiding. He's just a pnimi. He does everything for himself. A pnimi does everything for himself, remains unseen. He's right in front of your nose and you don't see him. Not you don't see him because he's hidden. You don't see him because he is now in himself. And anybody who's in himself can be right in front of you and you don't notice. That's my first illustration. Now wait, have patience. I have a few more, okay? Two more uno. I'll give you another vart, a similar vart. There was a chassid whose name was Rabbi Simpson. Rabbi Eli Simpson, he died in 1977. He was a very big chassid. A very big chassid, a tongue. And Rabbi Simpson had a very big problem. What was his problem? His problem was that he was a chassid of the Rebbe, but he also had a lot of respect for the Rebbe's brother-in-law who was called the Rashak. The Rebbe's brother-in-law, who was called Rabbi Gorari, Rabbi Shmuel Gorari, asked Rabbi Simpson to ask the Rebbe something for him. He wanted something from the Rebbe, and he already asked himself, and the Rebbe told him no. So he sent Rabbi Simpson. You understand? The Rebbe's brother in law wanted something from the Rebbe. The Rebbe didn't want to do it. So he sent Rabbi Simpson. Now, Rabbi Simpson had a problem. 
He couldn't say no to the Rashad and he wasn't going to ask the Rebbe. What do you do? Someone comes up, do me a favor, go and ask Rabbi Majeski something. Now, you, you want to do what that person wants, but you don't want to ask Rabbi Majeski. What do you do? <laughs> Rabbi Simpson walked into the Rebbe's room and didn't say a word. He stood there for a minute and walked out. <laughs> Later on, the Rebbe's brother was at Ashag went into the Rebbe and said, what, so what does the Rebbe think about my proposal? And the Rebbe says, I already told you no. So the Ashag says to the Rebbe, but I sent Rabbi Simpson. <laughs> I sent Rabbi Simpson. And the Rebbe sits up like this. He says, ah, I say it in Yiddish. It is a rhyme. Un hot geschwing. Aber a tiefenschweig. It is a rhyme. Un hot geschwing. Aber a tiefenschweig. Which means in English, he, he came in. He didn't say anything. He didn't say a word. But his silence was deep. His silence spoke. He came into the room. He stood, didn't say a word, and walked out. But his silence spoke. A thief In other words, he didn't say anything, but his not saying was so much. I'm trying to give you, Mishalom, examples for the idea of what I mean. Something can be right in front of you, you don't see it. You don't see it, not because it's hiding or it's blocked, but because it's not trying to be seen. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a third story. I'm trying to illustrate to you Using simple mishalom, plain mishalom, this mystical concept called hella ma'atzmi, how Hashem is hidden, not because he's hiding. Hashem is hidden because he exists in relationship with himself. Okay, here's the third story. In the city of Tel Aviv, in the 1940s, there was a civil war. There was a war. When it so declared itself an independent state, so the Arabs rose up, they tried to destroy us. And at some point in the city of Tel Aviv itself, there were snipers on both ends of the street. One sniper was an Arab, one sniper was a Jew. Whoever walked out was shot. If a Jew walked out, an Arab shot him. If an Arab walked out, a Jew shot him. So you couldn't walk in the street. There was a Yid who lived in Tel Aviv that everybody knew. I don't know how this is possible. Everybody knew he was a hidden tzaddik. Okay, if everybody knows how he was a hidden tzaddik, but he was, he was a shoemaker by profession. He was a shoemaker by profession. But he was pure and beautiful and holy and sweet and a tzaddik. They had a little girl, the minute I had a little girl, she was starving, had no food. So he says to his wife, I'm going to go to the bakery and get bread. So she says to him, if you go to the bakery, you're not coming back, they're going to shoot you. In the street, can't walk in the street. So he tells his wife in Yiddish, I won't see them and they won't see me. I, I won't see them and they won't see me. He went to the bakery, he got the bread, he came home, no bullet holes. He didn't see them and they didn't see him. Now, what does the story mean? I won't see them and they won't see me. <laughs> now, the simple shot was a tzaddik, tzaddik could do super stuff, yeah? But let's be psychological. Let's just say psychologically, yeah? If there is a war, a war, you know what a war is? The war is very simple, kill or be killed, not complicated. There's no nuance, there's no psychology over here. Yeah? And somebody sees a soldier running, what does he see? Does he see the person or does he see his fear? His pacha. It's a psychological puzzle, puzzle, that's all it is. Maybe when you see another person in the street, you're seeing not his physical body, but his, his emotions, his chemicals, his feelings. He says to his wife, I won't be afraid of them and I'm gonna be invisible to them. Now, I'm not saying that that's the meaning of the story, but it's, a, it's an insight, it's a, it's a meditation, it's a, it's a way of thinking about it. You don't have to hide to be hidden. You have to just not be seen. What do you have to do to not be seen? To go into yourself. Now we can't do that, right? If there's bullets flying from windows and I'm walking in the street, I'm very aware of the bullets. I'm full of fear. This man had such control over his mood that you didn't, he, he wasn't seen because he didn't see them. 
Again, I'm not saying that that's what the, the true meaning of the story is, but it's a contemplation. It's something to consider. It's a way of understanding his story. So what I'm trying to say to you is, girls, there's revealed that you see, there's hidden that you're prevented from seeing, and then there is not revealed and not hidden. And you don't see it. If it's not revealed and not hidden, why don't you see it? Because it's withdrawn. It's right in front of your nose, right in front of your nose, and you don't see it. Because the right words, because it's sneeristic, it's modest. When something exists in relationship itself, someone else doesn't notice, okay? Now, my fourth story, <laughs> and this is just funny, <laughs> but I talked to you before. A woman goes over to the Rebbe by dollars. We talked about this in the Sikhs classes, yeah. The Rebbe's giving dollars was not normal. The Rebbe stayed for three, four, five, six hours on a Sunday, giving out miracles. It was unreal. In one Sunday, the Rebbe could have given out 100 children. Mamish. Mamish. He would heal the sick. He would give childless couples children. He would give people that panos and money. It was nisim gluyim. Unbelievable. And a lady walks over to the Rebbe and she says to the Rebbe, quote, the Rebbe should reveal himself. She meant to say the Rebbe should reveal himself as Mashiach. So the Rebbe went like this. <laughs> what does this mean? How am I supposed to reveal myself if you're not looking? There's never been a tzaddik more revealed than I am right now. You don't see a yid should stand and give out godliness to thousands of people. Mamish, dollars was unbelievable. With Mamish, what Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to do, and Yisrael talked him down. That's what the Rebbe did on Sunday. He stood in a public place and he gave bracha vatzlocha. But he was giving out health and he was giving out panos, he was giving out nachas, he was giving out ariches he was giving out whatever a person wanted. And someone says the Rebbe should reveal himself. So what does the Rebbe say to her? <laughs> It's not my problem that you can't see. I should reveal myself. I've never been more revealed than I am right now. Dollars was greater than Yechidis. Yechidis, you went in alone to the Rebbe. You had a private conversation. Dollars was, was mamish, mass production. Every person got two seconds. And every dollar is a brocha. Every dollar is a nest. Every dollar is mamish alukus. And the lady says the Rebbe should reveal himself. Ta -da! Now you see. So you see, there's, hidden, there's revealed. There's hidden. And then there's something called not seen. But it's not not seen because it's hidden. It's not seen because it's withdrawn. It's in self. That is the meaning of the words Helem Ha'atzmi. Hashem is hidden because he's in himself. But he's not hiding. Hashem is hidden because he's in, he's not hiding, he's completely revealed. You don't see him. Why? Because you need to see chemicals. You need to see pheromones. You need to see a response. You need to see something interactive. When Hashem goes into himself, you don't see him because you need to feel him touching you. And he's not touching you. He's being by himself. Did you understand? Yeah, yeah. Did you understand? Now you understand why I got nervous about the Gvudas. I, I know where I wanted to go and you got me stuck over here with judgmentalism. Now, girls, um, wait, I want to say one more thing. I want to say one more thing. And then I'm going to take a break. It's already 12 o'clock. Um, but I think this time I'll actually break and we'll come back for a few more minutes. I'll make a second point. Um, have you heard of the word simpson? Yeah. Yes. Simpson, yeah. Who invented the term simpson? It's, it's a complicated story, but forgive me for making it simple. The Arizal. The Arizal introduced the idea of what's called the first, the idea of Tzimtzum you have in Zayar, but Tzimtzum, the Arizal invented the principle of the first Tzimtzum. The principle of the first Tzimtzum is a very powerful idea. And the foundation, the basis for the principle of the first Tzimtzum is a phenomena which is called Mokoyim, space. If Hashem is going to go away, he has to go away from some place. You can't have tzimtzum, there's no mokai. This gets lost on a lot of people, and they get very confused. The, 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 the Lurianic idea, the Arizal's idea, which is called tzimtzum, is predicated that there is a space. 
where Hashem is planning to make the world, and he evacuates, he goes out. You understand? You've heard the term, right? You've heard the term Simpson. Yes? Yeah? Everybody knows. Everyone here is familiar with the term Simpson, right? And there's a very big argument about this question of Simpson. Darizal says very plain when Hashem wanted to create the world, he first created a space. He doesn't even say it, but it's self understood. And he evacuated that space. And inside that space, Hashem is not. And in inside that space where Hashem is not, Hashem created the world. So far, so good? No. What does that mean, no? You don't understand what I just said? Okay, very good. So far, so good. What is the argument? When Hashem evacuated the space, did he actually leave? No. no. This, this is really a much more fundamental question. Hashem doesn't have space. If he doesn't have space and he creates space, does the space exist to him or only to us? It's very complicated. There's a bunch of very big rabbis screaming at each other for the last 300 years. <laughs> this is one of the big machloikas and chassidim and was on this question of Timsu. Hashem created a space and he evacuated himself from that space. And in that space, did he actually leave? Is the question. And there's four different opinions. One, two, three, four. As many as they could possibly be. How do you have four different opinions about one question? Leave it to the rabbis. <laughs> yeah, but here you have four opinions. For now. And the Mekubalim, there's a big, big tumult. And the, big, the, the greatest Kabbalists, Babish, the, the holiest and the greatest people argued about this question. The Alter Rebbe, our first Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe was Miyasa Chassidus Chabad came up with a radical idea about this question of sins, a radical that no one before him said, as far as I know. Okay, now I'm going to repeat myself a second time. What is the principle of Simpson? That there's space. If there's no space, there's no such thing. And that Simpson is vis-a-vis -vis in relationship with that space. And again, one of the things brought in Svarim is, but Hashem doesn't exist in space, so he can't leave it. He created the space, the space is relative. It exists to us and doesn't exist to him, and so forth. But putting that aside, the principle of Tzimtzum is there is a space, a mokayim, and Hashem evacuates the space, and different Kabbalists have different opinions about whether he's there. Tzimtzum kipshute or Tzimtzum shleikim. Is the Tzimtzum literal, that he literally evacuated the space, or Tzimtzum shleikim that didn't evacuate the space? The, the Alter Rebbe, the Bishnei Zaman of the Adi, in the Sefer Teira Ed, says something that none of the Mokubalim said. And it's very powerful and very important and relevant to us right here, right now, in this conversation that we're having. And I want you to understand, the entire class today is on one word. How a Lakim is higher than Avaya. That's our whole conversation. The Alter Rebbe makes the following assertion. That the whole question of Timson, the Lurianic idea that Rizal introduces us to a Kabbalistic concept of Timsum. The prerequisite to Timsum is Mokum. You can't have Timsum without Mokum. It has to be space. And he's evacuating that space. And the Mukubolim discuss whether he did leave the space or didn't leave the space, or it makes it appear like he left the space. Like I said before, four opinions. Says the Alter Rebbe, the entire debate is only about Oyerin Seif, about godliness, about God's revelation, about God's light. God's Giloy and God's help. What about God himself? What he calls Mo'el, the source for life? Or what we'll call in this conversation, Helem Ha'atzmi, how Hashem is hidden in relationship with self. I said, Helem Ha'atzmi, Hashem is hidden, but he's not hiding from you. He's not hiding from anybody. He's present in a state of etzem. He's withdrawn into himself. He's right in front of your nose and you don't see him, not because he's hiding, but because he's not attempting to be seen. And Dr. Rebbe says these words. This is a classic Chabad original idea. Adarabe hamo'er hu bihizgas. It's four words. Adarabe, to the contrary, hamo'er, that means the source, hu bihizgalos, is more revealed than ever. What happens to the sun when you take away its light? You could look at it, right? When there's an eclipse, a, a partial eclipse, a complete eclipse. If you try to look into the sun, it'll burn your corner, it'll hurt your eyes. But if you can take a glass, make it completely black that absorbs all the light, we can look directly at the sun. When the light is removed, you can see the source. It says the al Rebbe, when symptom happens, God is revealed. Because symptom has nothing to do with God. It has only to do with godliness. 
So when the Arizal said that when Hashem created the world, he created a space in a circle, in a glob, in a ball, in an eagle, and he took himself out of it, and all the Kabbalists argue about what this means, says the al Rebbe, the entire argument is only about oir, about revelation, or in the purposes of our conversation, Gilu and Helen, Mamala Kalam and Seved Kalam. What about Hashem himself? Helim Ha'atzmi. This is the term I'm teaching you today, right? The two new terms that I'm teaching you today is Helim Ha'atzmi, hidden, but not hidden from you. Hidden because he's withdrawn into himself, says the Alter Rebbe, Hashem is never more revealed than at the moment of Simpson. When God takes away the light, you know what's left? God. And he's completely revealed. And what do you see? I'm asking you a question. Nothing. But if he's revealed, how come you don't see him? Or to say differently, if I don't see him, why is he revealed? The answer is because he's taking his hands off his face. Ta-da! So how come I don't see? You don't see because you need to see chemicals. You need to see movement. You need to see dynamism. You need to see change. You need to see relationships. You need to be interaction. Hashem, as he is by himself, is completely revealed. And we don't see him, not because he's hiding, but because we don't have the art, because he's... His existing is withdrawn into himself. It's a very important, very important idea in Chabad theology that Hashem himself is not a part of Kabbalah. He's not. Kabbalah talks about godliness, not about God. And when you're talking about God, Hashem is here and is completely revealed and everybody sees him and no one sees him at all because he's not hiding. He's not revealing himself, but he's not hiding himself. He's existing in relationship with self. It's called helem ha'atzmi. Helem ha'atzmi. I'm hidden, but I'm not hidden from you. I'm hidden because I'm in myself. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah? Yeah? This is called elakim. Elakim. Not havaya. It's called a lakim. This name a lakim is hidden, but not because it's hiding. It's not gvura. We experience it as gvura. Why do we experience it as gvura? Because we don't see him. But it's not, it's not chesed, it's not kibur, it's not the fetus. It's how he is by himself. So now, when Yitzchok gave Yanka Avinu a bracha, and he said, likim, that you're a bracha to come straight from Elokim. There's no greater bracha than that. That's why we say it in Masa Shabbos. It's a bracha that's coming from godliness, not from godliness, from God that's above the whole idea of having any relationship with the world as Hashem is entirely by himself, as he totally by himself. So now, girls, if Asiya starts on page 12 of the Siddha, any Makabala lie, mitzvah say, shall we have to let come? Matevo lecha yaikin, Mishkin Sekh, Vani Berev Khastaka of Visaka. I'm going to come into your house. Hashem lets me into his home and I'm going to dive into him. I'm going to talk to him and I'm going to go through the world of Asiya. And at the very end of Asiya, I'm going to come to the godliness of Asiya. What's the godliness of Asiya? First Hashem and then Elikim. Remember? Remember? Hashem Elikim. Because Elikim over here is higher than Hashem. Hashem means the maximum revelation of God. Elikim means not he's revealed, not he's hidden. He just is. <laughs> he's in front of your face and you don't see him. And again, the four words in Taira Oir, Adarabe, to the contrary, Hama Oir, the source, who be his galus. When you take away godliness, the only thing left is God. You should see him. At the moment of Tzimtzum, that is all the Lurianic idea of Tzimtzum Arisha. Hashem creates space. He evacuates the light from that space. It should be room for a world, says the Alter Rebbe. That's the moment you meet God himself. As he is by himself. 
I cannot tell you how many my modem of our Rebbe, our Rebbe, this is from our Rebbe's ideas, that says there was never a greater moment in the entire creation than the moment of Tzim Samarish. Because when Hashem took away his light, you know what was left? <laughs> Hashem. And there was nothing to obstruct it. The light doesn't let you see the sun. When there's no light, you can look straight at the sun. At the moment of Tzim Samarish, at the moment of maximum concealment, you know what you have? Bog. Nebish to himself. You understand? And this is called a lukim. Lamna Tzayich bin Gines is about Shem Lekim. Now I want to remind you, three weeks ago when we started this, I told you that this is a prayer of Goyim. Why? Because it means concealment. It's still a prayer of Goyim. It says that after Mashiach comes, the Goyim are going to say this, but for a very different reason. Because this Pedic is about the idea of, of godliness, which is above revelation. Okay? Okay. Questions or comments? I agree. If you're uptight, I'm also uptight. <laughs> but you understand why I got so nervous when we started talking about what, if, you, if you understood what I prepared to talk about, I said, oh my God, <laughs> we're wasting our time. But we, uh, we got back. We got back to where we had to go. Questions or comments? Go ahead. Helam Ha'atzmi, or sometimes Helam Be'et. Hidden because he's gone into himself. As he is by himself. Helam Ha'atzmi. In Sambach you have it again and again and again. Helam Ha'atzmi. So a lot of my modern, when they want to describe Hashem, use the word Atmos or Atmos Amhus. Atmos means Hashem as he is by himself. And sometimes they use the word Helam Ha'atzmi. means he's hidden. But he's not hidden because he's hiding. He's hidden because we don't see. Why don't we see? Because he's etzem. He's by himself. And this is wow, amazing. Huh? I'm impressed. <laughs> now wait, if you have no questions or comments, I have one more thing to say. You good? No, 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 no. I want to take a break. I want a space. So go ahead. I want to be interrupted. This is the first thought that came to mind. This is like a thought that came to mind after everything, like relating to people and the self. It's like we were created in God's image, right? So we all have that, like Edson, right? That's right. And we, every whatever I see of you, whatever I see of her, and then that's just like kind of the light that's outwards, but it's almost impossible for someone it's to impossible. see. It is impossible for someone to see you. And that's how we're like, even though we were created in God's image, we're incapable of taking away the light. Wait, but us. we can know ourselves on that level. Yeah. And that's called health. Most of us live with noise. A friend of mine once told me about a mutual friend. If that person stops to talk, they think they're going to disappear. Should I say it again? You know, some people need revelation. They're afraid of it. They're afraid of what's underneath. It's illness. It's sickness. I need to make noise. I need to have experiences. I need to have light. I need to be involved with other people. I can't stop talking. I need to be busy. What happens if they withdraw? They go into themselves. What they find inside themselves frightens them. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yes. You understand? A healthy person, there's a the previous Rebbe, the previous Rebbe kept a page as a child. The previous Rebbe loved books, Svarim. And he had a great mind. So he used to read through books by the hundreds. He would just rather look through books. And every once in a while, he would find a quote that he liked. And yet a special page where he wrote them all down. It's a fa the page is now printed. It's maybe 20 or 30 quotes from different Svarim. And the Fiedic Rebbe collected from the, the weirdest books in the world. You never even heard of these Svarim. And he kept the record of these pay, of these quote quotes because he liked them. One of the quotes that was on the Friedrich Rebbe's list of quotable quotes was, Toiva haprishus im habrius vabedidus b'teich b'neyam. Toiva haprishus, it's good to be alone amongst people. Vabedidus b'teich b'neyam. And salatudinus in the community. 
You should be by yourself amongst people. And you should have your own private space in the community. What does that mean? It cannot be either or. If I can't be amongst people, I'm sick. If I need to define myself entirely with other people, I'm also sick. So what's health? I'm amongst the people and then there's my space. And you can't take it from me because it isn't a table, it isn't a chair, it's here. It's very hard to give over in English. Bedidus means solitude. Aloneness amongst other people. You can be in a room full of people and you can even be in talking to them and then there's a place of you which is bodod. Hashem bodod yanchenu ve'en ime el neicha. Bodod, all by himself. Solitude, alone. That's our truth. That's our essence. Our essence. That's what the word essence means. Me by myself. Right, and to give you a corollary, malachim, don't have an essence. Omar has a name based on what he's doing. Based on the No, it's what he's doing. There is no who he is. A Malach is busy doing things. You take away his actions, he disappears. So when the when 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 Yankir meets the Malach of Asaph and asks him his name in, in Genesis and by Yishlach, when Shimshana Gibe's parents meet an angel, Manoyach and his wife, and they ask him his name, what do they answer? Why you ask me my name? So Rashi says, uh, you cannot ask an angel what his name is, because the entire name of an angel is his function. If you take away from an angel what he does, there's nothing left. But a human being is not an angel. We have an essence. We're in the image of God. That's our aloneness. That's our alakim. That's higher than Abai. So in Asiya, if Hashem Melech, Hashem Molech, Hashem Yimlech is meeting godliness in maximum revelation, Elikim V'chaneinu is meeting the concealment of godliness, which is even higher than that, because it's not hiding, it's not blocked, it's by itself. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. <laughs> I'm not making this up, girls. I'm not making this up. This says in Chassidus, I'm simply delivering it. I have it here in my notes. I can try in my sources. I'm not making one word up. Now, there's one more thing I need to say before I let you go. Okay? And the one more thing I need to say is that this idea has a philosophical illusion. This idea that something is hidden because it exists by itself has a philosophical articulation. There's a way to explain it in Kabbalah language. Actually, it's really, you can say it's Kabbalah language. And you know what the word that is used to denote this entire hour that we just spent talking about Elohim? The face, Ponim, which connects it to the Menorah that we talked about last week. It connects it to the Bechas Kainim we talked about last week. It connects it to Moshe Rabbeinu's communication with Hashem. Ponim, what do you know by looking at a person's face? Nothing. Nothing and everything. Yeah. Nothing and everything. The Kabbalistic form for this is Mitzchah. In Kabbalah, it comes with mitzvah, the, the forehead and the two cheeks. Okay, the face, the human face, which represents atzilus, represents godliness, has three madregas. Big holes, little holes, and a mask. The big holes are the mouth, and the biggest hole of all, right? The mouth, the ears, the nostrils, and the eyes. They're holes, big holes. Shaiftim v'shaitim titan l'chol shalach, it says in the Sefer Shachal HaToyro, you have seven gates in your face. The two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils in your mouth. You put a judge in front of those gates, but what you let in and what you let out. You follow? They're big holes. And they're actually the lowest level. They're portals. They're windows into the neshama of a person, the eyes of a person, the ears of a person, the nostrils of a person, and the mouth of a person. And then there's little teeny tiny holes. What are the little holes? Every hair, right? Every hair is a little straw. It's hollow in the middle. Shy hair is little teeny straws. And in Kabbalah, it's explained that through the hair, life comes out of the head. So the big holes are the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, and the mouth. The little holes are the hair. And the third level is the mask. This and this. It's completely hidden, blocked. That's called your punim. 
Your eyes are not your face. Your ears are not your face. They're sha'orim, they're gates, they let in and out. Your hair is not your face, they let in and out, just a lot less. Or whatever, however they explain what the hair is. Your face means the part of your head that covers, that blocks. And it's called in Kabbalah, mitzvah, your forehead. So according to Kabbalah, there's called mitzvah dezor and mitzvah da atik. there's a lower face and a higher face. The difference between the lower face and the higher face, the lower face hides everything. See nothing. Nichiva, punished. Mm -hmm. The higher face reveals everything. Punim. What does the face of God look like? What's punim? The face of God is called the Lakim girls, not Hawaii. The face of God either reveals nothing who reveals everything, and it doesn't reveal everything in the way of revelation. It just is, is. it just bees. Hashem is in hiding. Hashem is in revealing. Hashem is existing. Helem ha'atzmi. <laughs> this, this is a great story. Ah, Ta-da! What do you see now? So we have a new concept here, very important concept, very profound concept. Before you leave the world of Asiya, you meet the face of God. Helam me. the idea that God doesn't reveal, doesn't hide, just exists, and he's completely revealed, completely revealed, and you could miss him completely. Hamar Ruba's gas, Hashem is totally revealed, and what do you see? You see totally nothing. Why? Because you're busy making noise. You understand? You're busy looking for motion. Right? What do animals do when they're being hunted? What are animals with being hunted? They run away. What if they can't run away? They stand motionless. They can be right in the open. As long as they don't flick their ear or wag their tail or sneeze, the hunter looks straight at them and doesn't see them. They blink. Boom. Right? This is when something is completely still. He doesn't have to be hidden to be hidden because he's withdrawn. It's very, very hard to stay still when you're nervous. Huh? <laughs> That's the meaning of I won't see them and they won't see me. That's what we're learning. This entire capital is a lakim. It's like I said, I started out the conversation by saying it's a prayer for Goyim. You see where we've gone? I'll see you after Pesach, Kindalach. Okay, Chaga Pesach, Koshe Besameach. Thank you all for coming and listening. Yeah, we are Mashiach now. The Hashem should not only protect Yidin, he should protect all of God's children, all God's creations. And bring this Gaza Mashiach. How do I turn this off?